Monday, Monday afternoon, afternoon. Theologian. We interrupt this introduction to bring you a new episode. Wait a second. Isn't what you just said actually an introduction? Oh, well, that's the thing. It's kind of mind-blowing. Think about this for just a second. Let it sink in. The interruption is the introduction. It's like when you're busy trying to come up with an idea for how to introduce a new episode, and something interrupts you. And you think, wait, this interruption is actually that idea that I was looking for. Yeah. Or like when you're busy trying to raise your kids and help turn them into responsible adults one day, and they interrupt you while you're doing whatever you're doing, and you find out that the interruption is the parenting. It's the new episode of parenting. Exactly. And from my experience, every day was a new episode in parenting. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? Or when you say, We now interrupt season six to bring you a series of new episodes. The interruption is the new season. (laughs) Now, wait a sec. That's almost too cool for words. I know, right? So basically, what we're discovering is that life is a series of interruptions that become the new episode in whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Right. It's like the plot twists in life. Like when you discover that the philanthropist is really the bad guy in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yes, exactly. Or like when Bruce Willis realizes he's dead in the sixth sense. Or, and this is the plot twist to season six. Which is actually becoming season seven. Yes, which is actually becoming season seven. We're going to look at people whose stories reveal interruptions that become new episodes. So this is not just an interruption to our discussions about theology. These are true stories. Some might call them testimonies or testimonials. And they reveal theology that is practically at work in people's lives. Right. That's so true. And the first category of testimony has to do with life interruptions. And these real-life interruptions in people's lives become a practical way for us to see how theology actually factors into real life. Exactly. So if you think of theology as the theory of how God works, then these testimonies are the application of the theology. Ah, that makes sense. Some of the interruptions that happen to us in life, and which we're going to see in these true stories, have to do with disappointment. Sometimes it's that disequilibrium that you experience when a major interruption makes you feel like somebody has just yanked the rug out from underneath your solid foundation. And we'll also share stories about some of the unexpected messengers that God uses to get our attention and give us the right word at the right time so that we can get it and turn our life around by leaning the full weight of our faith on him. So we're going to talk about a a true story, but I'm going to give a little bit of background before we get in there. This story has to do with an Olympian. You know, if you know anything about Olympic sports, some of them led themselves to multiple medals because of the nature of the competition. In Olympic basketball, there's only one gold medal. There's only one silver. There's only one bronze. But some of the sports, there's many more medals because each race or each competition is an event unto itself. In swimming, there are many, many medals that are given out in gymnastics, especially in women's gymnastics. I think there's only six. There are four apparatus. There's an all-around competition, and then there's a team competition. So some sports lend themselves to many more medals than others. If we go back to 1972, Mark Spitz... American swimmer, wins seven gold medals and seven world records. And it was this huge hoopla for such an accomplishment. But by the time we get 30-something years later, we see Michael Phelps is going into the Beijing Olympics, and he's supposed to win a lot of medals. In fact, he wins eight golds. This really wasn't that unexpected because of the caliber of swimmer he was, but he still had to outperform all of those other Olympic caliber athletes that he was competing against. Mm -hmm. So this takes us to our story today, and it has to do with an Olympic gymnast named Sean Johnson. Now, she was really, really talented. She was favored to win four gold medals. 
So she gets into her first event, and before she gets to her first routine, it's mathematically impossible for her to win the event. If she gets a perfect 10, she can't make up the point deficit. She has to decide what she's going to do. And she decides she's going to go out there, give it her all. She gives her life's performance knowing that the best she could do was play second. And it crushed her. She felt like a failure. And this carried on to her later events. Later in another event, she did win gold. And it still felt like a disappointment. I mean, I can't even imagine how that might feel. She's been projected to win four. She can't do it in the first one. She wins another one and feels awful. And at that time, her total identity was tied to gymnastics. Nothing else in her life mattered as much. And so in between Olympic Games, she moved on to other endeavors, some of which were very public. And she was criticized and felt unaccepted because she didn't look like the supermodel caliber uh, competitors that she was competing against. She's only four foot eight. How could she possibly be expected to look like those other competitors? It gave her that same feeling of disappointment for not being able to measure up. Mm -hmm. So as we fast forward in life to 2012, she is a total mess emotionally while she's preparing for the Olympics. And as she's struggling through her day-to-day -day preparation for the next games, she can't really handle it, and she chooses not to go. She chose not to be shackled to the expectations to win more medals. And she retired just like that. But this was not something she entered lightly. She only did it because God told her that she did not need to go through all of that preparation to be of value to him. She realized that achieving the top in her gymnastics endeavor wasn't really anything. Now, the world would tell us that being in the top is it. That's the pinnacle. But it really isn't. She discovered that God is the answer. He is the top. And he is enough. Sean has an answer to those who don't understand how she could just walk away from something that she had spent so many years preparing for and gave her such notoriety. But she says, Jesus' sacrifice is more important than any personal achievement. Winning a pile of Olympic medals pales in comparison to knowing him. His gift of salvation and acceptance is based on grace, not in our achievement. And he did everything necessary for us to be saved. He is the greatest award. Worldly success is nothing in comparison to knowing Jesus. Man, what a story. And I don't know if there's any of us who can't relate in some aspect of this to Sean, because I'm sure that all of us have had those times in our lives when we feel like I've given this my all, but my all is not enough. I'm a failure. We might feel like pretenders because we realize in our own mind, we, we don't think we can measure up to the expectations of the people around us. Right. And if you want to hear that story in her own words, you can find it at the I Am Second website. And it's very moving to hear her tell this story. Yeah. And it's an easy search. You just go to I Am Second, type in her name, and boom, it's right there. I have been put in mind, as you were telling me about Sean Johnson, I was thinking about a couple of other athletes that I realized who have talked a little bit about their struggle with what they thought was supposed to be worldly success. They revel in a win for a moment or a trophy, but they say that the excitement only lasts a very short time. And then it's on to the next victory. They have to start looking at the film from last week's game. They say, I've, I've just got to take it one game at a time or one performance at a time. And they finally get to the point when they realize Jesus is the only one who can give lasting satisfaction beyond all these worldly successes. Even as a kid, now this is speaking to the older crowd, I'm sure, unless you happen to be a sports history buff. But as a, a kid of about 10 years old, my dad took me to a Christian Athletes in Action banquet in Phoenix. And Tom Landry, who was at that time the NFL coach of the Dallas Cowboys, showed some highlight reels of his career, including a great big win for the Super Bowl. And he shocked all of us that day by saying, you know what? There's more to life than winning. 
I discovered that the elation from that win only lasted about 48 hours. And I realized that Jesus Christ is the only thing in my life that gives me the kind of satisfaction that I crave and that I need, and it's going to last for eternity. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear him say that because to the fans who would watch the game and were rooting for the Cowboys, you know, that elation goes on and on, and they taunt fans of other teams for months. And yet to those involved in it, it's like, okay, move on. I've also heard some athletes talk about how they just felt like a has-been and they would never measure up to something that they did way back when they were pretty young comparatively. And then how do you live for decades beyond that, always pointing back to some big accomplishment when you know you're never going to trump that accomplishment? And so if your identity is completely wrapped up in performing, it's good for us to know that God's acceptance of us and his salvation of our very souls is not dependent on our performance. It's strictly because of what he did for us. And that's a pretty big deal. That is a big deal. One of the things that I noticed as we're talking about these people's real stories, their testimonies, they're starting to understand that their story becomes a living word that might capture somebody else's attention. When I heard Tom Landry's story, that for me was compelling. When we hear about Sean Johnson, that story becomes a living word but they're pointing us to something that's even more lasting than their testimony, and that is the written word. So the Bible is where they found their security in Jesus. And I'm hoping that these particular living word stories, these testimonies, will point us to something that's even greater than their story. And that's the story that we find in the Bible, because it tells us about Jesus Christ and what he can mean for us. Exactly. And if we look back at Sean's story, She felt a keen disappointment in losing, which in this case was finishing second. But she had her faith to fall back on, and she allowed her faith in Jesus to be the sustaining force that gave her the peace to know that retiring from gymnastics was perfectly okay. Now, it's conceivable that some of our fellow theologians have not started that relationship and have nothing to hold on to except their sport or their career. Maybe we can help them change that even today. I think that's a really good idea. We never know who's going to be listening. Um, I'm not sure who's listening to my voice right now, but it's no accident that you're here and that you're listening to us. So I'm going to pray. And if you're at that point when you say, you know, I realize that I need something deeper in life than just trying to have human accomplishments because I still feel like I'm falling short no matter how hard I try. This could be that moment for you when you can say a prayer like this and start a brand new path and get onto Jesus' path. It could go something like this. God, I pray that you will put me on that path, that I will start following Jesus, and that as I follow in his footsteps and get to know him through the Bible and through hanging out with other believers who are on that same journey, I pray that you'll show me what it means to be accepted by you, not because of my performance, but simply because of your grace. Thank you for that forgiveness that you offer me so freely. I need that forgiveness. I accept it. I want that weight of sin and guilt and shame to be lifted off my shoulders. And I know you're doing that through your Holy Spirit right now. Thank you for that. And now I want to follow you and get to know you by putting you at the center of my life, because I know you're the one who's going to show me what real satisfaction looks and feels like and that your satisfaction lasts for eternity and not just for 48 hours. And so thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a purpose in my life. Continue to reveal what my purpose is as I learn to put you first. And thank you that I can be second, and that's okay, because you're number one in my life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's also possible that some of our fellow theologians are already in a relationship with Christ, but The things of life have become more important, and maybe they need to return to him and reset their priorities. So let's help them do that right now. I would be happy to do that kind of a sample prayer as well. I can identify with that. I think a lot of us in ministry have watched the church change pretty dramatically in the last three or four years, and we realize that sometimes the measurements that we were using is the wrong metric. We're using it based on the wrong ruler. We need to start saying, what about my commitment to Christ and my faithfulness, regardless of how many people do or don't show up in a church service? 
or how many people we're baptizing each year. It's not about nickels, numbers, and noses. It's about our faithfulness to Christ. And so you may be in that similar situation. You may be trying to achieve, 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 hoping that you can feel successful in some way, and you just haven't felt successful, even though you've been walking with Christ for a number of years. This is your time to be able to recommit your, yourself to him and to get things back on track by measuring according to his standards rather than the world's standards. You could say a prayer similar to this one. God, I thank you that you see me exactly where I am. You have known my struggles and you can guide me back onto the path because I've started to stray from looking specifically to you. Help me to keep my eyes focused on you because you're the author and finisher of my faith and that nothing else is going to bring the kind of satisfaction that you can. Forgive me that I have started to take my eyes away from what I know should be my real goal in life and that you are the prize. And I've been striving after other prizes and the accolades of others or the pats on the back or feelings of success, whether it's a good grade or promotion at work or more money or a bigger car or bigger house or whatever. I just pray that you'll help me to re-identify myself with being sold out to you. Let me lay down my life, as Paul would talk about, just uh, laying our life down so that we can identify with the Christ on the cross who bought my life back for me. You paid so that I could be set free, just paying for my ransom because I was shackled by all the worldly things that kept my eyes from being fixed on you. Help me to be able to trust you fully, to lean into you, and to trust that you are the rock of my salvation, the foundation, the chief cornerstone, and I can stand firmly on you so that no matter what may be considered a success in this world, I don't have to worry about that. You love me just the way I am, and you accept me, and you give me a life forever. Help me to start just loving you back and trusting that you're going to show how my life takes on a brand new meaning by becoming second and by putting you first. And I thank you for that. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, for one, am glad that you interrupted season six as we start season seven because I know that I'm going to find these stories really inspirational and relational. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we can tap into the experience of other believers, and even some that weren't believers when their interruption started, mm -hmm. and see how God can use the circumstances in life to glorify himself and to lead people to Christ. Yeah, amen to that. I've already been inspired. And we're praying that some of these stories are going to be fleshing out that theory of theology and becoming the practicum so that we can see that when we become the arms and legs of Christ, as a missionary shared with us just last Sunday, we, we can become like Christ to those around us. And so we're putting skin on all that theory. And that's how he becomes real, because we are the earthly extension of the body of Christ, we the church. And so our story can become something powerful to somebody else as well. So we're hoping that this might inspire some of us who have been walking with Christ for a while to share our stories, not just about when we were saved. It might have been years ago, but how is God at work in your life this week? What has he done for you lately? And by sharing those true stories, you can become the living word that might help point them into the written word and that they might become inspired too to put God first in their life. And it's okay to take second seat because that's not a bad place to be when God is in the driver's seat. Not a bad place to be all. There are many athletes who would have loved to have won a silver medal. No kidding. And I'm grateful for people like Sean, who got to see the truth and is willing to share that with other people because her story is becoming inspirational and so much more helpful, I think, for eternity in people's lives than if she had won gold, maybe even many golds. What if she had won six and that became the pinnacle of her career? she might not have had nearly the impact in people's lives where it really counts. I and mean, where it counts is in our spiritual life. So thank you, Sean, for sharing your story. We'll put a link in the description to this video for that I Am Second story that Sean shares. All right, thanks for joining us. And we do hope that you will join us again in this interruption to season six, which is actually becoming season seven, talking about true stories of interruptions that can become very powerful in our lives. Join us next time for that next episode of 
Monday, Monday afternoon, afternoon. Theologians. 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 Theologians.